It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Pan Gongsheng, Governor of the People's Bank of China, who is going to give a keynote speech followed by Q&A. And this session will be moderated by Mr. Norman Chan, Senior Advisor, Hong Kong Academy of Finance, and former Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. So please give a big welcome to Mr. Pan and Mr. Chan. Hello, everybody. I must say I'm very, very pleased to see so many old and new friends. Uh, I think in my former life as chief executive at KMA, if you call it a life at all, uh, there's nothing comparable, nothing comparable with so many serving governors and uh, former governors uh, in, this, in this big room. The closest uh, is the IMF meetings. Uh, but there are two big differences. Uh, I see a lot of smiling faces here, but I don't see that at all. Ravi can testify to that. They're very serious and very solemn. And the second difference is even, even uh, more important. They don't feed us. They don't feed us with good food, where we do try our best to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to serve you. So thank you very much, Eddie. Augustine for organizing this, this very uh, great conference to celebrate HKMA's birthday, 30th, and uh, Asian Office BIS for 25th. Now, we are very honored to have Dr. Pan Gongshen, uh, Governor of People's Bank of China, here to give a keynote speech. Governor Pan should be well known to all of you, and uh, it's in no introduction. After very distinguished career in the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China and the Agricultural Bank of China. Dr. Pan joined the People's Bank in 2012 uh, as deputy governor and later took charge of the state administration of foreign exchange. So clearly, Governor Pan has played a key role in the reform and development of China's banking and financial systems. But not only that, uh, Governor Pan has been a good friend and supporter of Hong Kong. I had had the privilege of working closely with uh, Governor Pan over these years in helping to promote Hong Kong's position as the premier international financial center. I still have very vivid and fond memory of us too. In 2017 in Hong Kong, launching the Spawn Connect scheme where we try very hard to beat the gong, the Chinese gong, bang, bang, and uh, supposed to do it one time, so we're so happy. We, we did it three times, uh, uh, well uh, about what is uh, uh, permissible. So without further ado, let us give a round of applause to uh, welcome Governor Pang for his keynote speech. Thank you, Norman, for your kind introduction. General Manager Augustine Cousins, Chief Executive Eddie Ru, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to attend the Hong Kong MA BIS High Level Conference and celebrate Hong Kong MA 30th anniversary and the BIS Asian Office's 25th anniversary with you. I would like to take this opportunity to talk about how we see the Chinese economy, our monetary policy response, where we are in the financial sector opening, PBOC's participation in the international financial governance, and uh, last but uh, not least, the special role of Hong Kong in the international financial, as an international financial center. First, uh, how we say the Chinese economy. China's economy has, as a whole, continued to gain momentum in recovery 
GDP grow by 5.2% in, in the first three quarters and expected to achieve the five growth target for the whole year. The IMF recently raised its 2023 growth forecast for China to 5.4%, which is still relatively high among the world's major economies. We could break down the GDP and talk a closer look. For, for, for consumption, the, its contribution to GDP has been on the rise, and the service sector is doing well. In October, retail sales enjoyed a good growth of 7.6% year on year. For investment, in the first 10 months, manufacturing investment increased by 6.2% from a year ago. And if real estate investment were excluded, private investment would actually be growing by 9.1% year on year. Investment in high tech has been growing fast at the rate of the 11%. As for foreign trade, the value of ex imports and exports denominated in RMB stopped the decline and went up about 1% year on year in October. Quantity wise, the volume of the import and the export has actually maintained a growth at around 10%. Over the past year or so, many central bankers around the world have been troubled by the problem of uh, persistent high inflation. But for China, the problem is somewhat different. Now CPI is gradually bottoming out in China. It returned to positive growth in August and September, but it dropped a little bit in October, mainly due to the 4% drop in food prices, especially a 30% fall in pork price, which is a very big component of the CPI in China. <coughs> we don't think the fall in food price will sustain and expect CPI to go up afterwards. There have been some green shoots on the PMI front. Manufacturing PMI has in January stayed in an upward trajectory from May this year. Service PMI is doing much better and has stayed in an expansionary territory since the beginning of this year. When we look at China's economy, we need to pay attention to two things. First, China's GDP is already more than 120 trillion yuan, or 18 trillion US dollars. It would be difficult to grow at the rate of 8 or 10 percent like in the past. Second, China is experiencing a transition of the economic growth model. The tradition model of relying heavily on infrastructure on the real estate might generate higher growth, but would also delay structural adjustment and undermine growth sustainability. High quality and sustainable growth is far more important so right now, we should focus more on improving economic structure and forming new growth drivers. The ongoing economic transformation will be a long and difficult journey, but it is a journey we must take. Looking ahead, the Chinese economy remains highly resilient thanks to its strengths such as innovation ability, big market, gold infrastructure, well-established industrial chains, rich and well-educated 
human resources, just to name a few. As renewable energy and other new drivers of economy continue to grow, and as the recent policy measures gradually take effect, such as those supporting the real estate sector, reducing the debt burden of the local governments, as well as the issuance of an additional one trillion RMB central government bond. I'm confident that China will enjoy healthy and sustainable growth in the 2024 and beyond. Second, let me talk about PBOC's mandatory policy response. In general, we have kept our mandatory policy accommodative to support economic development. This year, the PBOC has used a mix of tools, including cutting the reserve requirement ratio twice, cutting policy rate twice, and guiding the market rate, including the LPR, to go down. As a result, monetary and financial conditions have remained favorable for economic development. M2 and the total social financing increased by 10.3% and 9.3% year on year in October, respectively. The weighted average lending rate of corporate loans was 3.8% in September, the lowest level in the recorded history of the PBOC. And in the meantime, we are also making use of structural monetary policy instruments when appropriate in support of small business, green finance, and innovation. As of the end of third quarter this year, PBOC outstanding lending through structural instruments totaled 7 trillion yuan, about 15% of our balance sheet. Going forward, the PBOC will continue to keep its monetary policy accommodative to provide support to our economy. Third, let me talk about where we are in the financial sector opening. First, we have uh, significantly expanded market access for foreign financial institutions. We have removed the foreign ownership cap for banks, insurers, and uh, securities companies, and uh, substantially expanded their business scope. We have also improved the institutional arrangements and the line financial opening, including regulatory rules, supervisory stand standards. Many foreign financial institutions have uh, established a commercial presence in China. About two weeks ago, we just issued the bank card clearing license for MasterCard to operate in China. Over the last two months, Vice Premier He Lifeng held roundtable meetings with the business communities in both Germany and the United States on the sidelines of his visit to those two countries. The PBOC also has a fine tradition to regularly listen to the financial institutions to seek, to seek their advice and suggestions. I sat down with the representatives of foreign financial institutions in Beijing this September. And this morning, I have just met with the representatives of the financial institutions here in Hong Kong to say where we could help to make their business easier. Second, we have a broadened opening of China's financial markets. China now has the world's second largest bond market. China's stocks and bonds have been included into the leading global indexes, such as MSCI, Fuzzy Russell, Bloomberg Barclays, and JP Morgan. Foreign investors now hold around 3.3 trillion yuan in China's bond market. 
growing at the annual rate about 30% in the past several years. Responding to the demand and the desire of the international investors, we have made it more convenient for foreigners to invest directly in China's financial markets. Meanwhile, through our source of connect schemes, such as the Stock Connect, the Bond Connect, the Swap Connect, we are providing financial foreign investors more options to invest in China through other channels, of which Hong Kong plays a prominent role. Hong Kong serves as a key bridge connecting mainland financial markets with the international market. Third, RMB is more widely accepted and used in international trade and financial transactions. The PBOC follows a market-driven approach to cross-border use of RMB and focus on improving institutional arrangements and financial infrastructure. The international use of RMB has been rising steadily in the cross-border payments investment and financing, and foreign exchange, foreign exchange reserves. The international use of RME has started to generate network effect, and is providing more choices for market players at home and abroad. It has facilitated trade and investment, reduced exchange rate risks, and cut currency conversion costs. China's experiences have shown that opening up is a strong driving force for high development of the financial markets. It helps the financial sector to better support the real economy and become more competitive internationally. Fourth, let me briefly talk about the PPOC's participation in the global financial governance. The world has entered a period of turmoil and uh, transformation. And the international governance, international governance system is also undergoing profound changes. The PBOC has, not, has not been an active participant in global financial governance through such fora like the G20, the MF, and the BIS. We are, also, we are also actively participating in bilateral financial cooperation. This year, China has established financial working groups with both the US and the EU. The PBOC is the leading agency in China, on the Chinese side for both groups. They provide ongoing China to strengthen communication coordination and macroeconomic and monetary policies, promote financial stability and deepen, and deepen practical financial cooperation with both the US and the EU. Going forward, the PBOSA will continue to uphold multilateralism and con contribute our share to more, not less, economic and financial integration of the world. First, we will strengthen macroeconomic policy dialogue and coordination to jointly promote global growth and financial stability. Second, we will push for global governance reform to make financial governance more fair and more efficient. This will include improving IMF's governance structure and representativeness. Third, we will work with other economies to keep global industrial and supply chains stable and promote economic globalization that is more open, inclusive, balanced, and beneficial for all. Next, but uh, not least, let me talk about the special role that Hong Kong can play as an international financial center. Hong Kong is one of the major international hubs in the world. It has an open and free business environment, sophisticated financial markets, 
well-functioning financial infrastructure, a vast talent pool, a sound legal system, and a regulatory system were aligned with the international practices. It is the world's largest offshore RMB market. It is also Asia's largest asset and wealth management, wealth management center and the second largest center for hedge funds and the private equity. The PBOC is committed to supporting Hong Kong's rule as the international financial center. We will continue to create a enabling environment for the RMB business in Hong Kong. We will continue to support Hong Kong's rule as an international asset center and the risk, man risk management center, and its goal to become a fintech and a green finance hub in the Asia Pacific region. We will continue to support Hong Kong's financial stability. We believe that with all the strengths, a favorable policy environment, and its a talented and hardworking people, Hong Kong, standing as the international financial center, will be further enhanced. That is my today's speech. Before I, I take up your questions, let me wish this conference a great success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Pan, for this very comprehensive uh, speech covering different aspects of China's economic and financial developments. Now it's uh, Q&A time, all right? Uh, I received quite a number of uh, inquiries from participants uh, who asked me to raise this question with you. Uh, as we know, the property sector, the property market in Mainland China has got into trouble for a while now. Uh, it's an area as concerned that a uh, lot of us, uh, bankers or central bankers alike, are quite concerned about. Is something you can share with us? What's your current assessment of the situation? And also, there are some measures that have taken by the authorities to address the problem. And what do you think? Uh, the situation would become? Would it be enough to stabilize situation going forward? Would you be kind enough to share with us your, 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 your insights? There is a fluctuation in the property market, not, not, not only in China, but in many countries. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I understand that there are a lot of the concerns about China's property market. Uh, let me share some of my observations on this issue. China began its uh, housing reform in the 1990s, three decades ago, with the uh, with, uh, acceleration of urbanization. Please take a seat. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> He's very kind. <laughs> Respect for the old man. <laughs> with the uh, acceleration of uh, urbanization and uh, industrialization, China enjoyed a real estate boom for almost three decades. So people's living conditions in China have improved significantly. And the poor capita living space for urban residents is more than 40 square meters. I don't know how, how much it is in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> After decades of rapid expansion, the real estate sector in China is in the middle of the major transition and has the following characteristics. The first demand, demand for newly built housing is on the decline. Second, the real estate market varies from city, from city to city. Housing demand in the first or second tier cities is expected to remain solid. Whereas, the, but in the some third or fourth tier cities, it's on the decline. Third, as the urbanization continues, demand is shifting from the new houses to pre-earned ones. Rental demand is also on the rise. So as a result, 
the real estate market is experiencing some adjustments. In the long run, such adjustment is beneficial for the transition of China's economic development and growth sustainability. But in the short run, we should focus on mitigating the spillover risks and the smooth the transition process. To this end, we have taken a, a host of measures, including cutting down payment ratios, reducing mortgage rates, encouraging commercial banks to renegotiate old contracts with the borrowers to cut mortgage rates. That is, uh, years ago, the, the individuals borrow, the, the, the borrowers, that is, the interest, the, its interest rate is high. So we encourage the commercial banks to renegotiate with the borrowers to cut, in, cut the mortgage rates. Relaxing purchase restrictions, providing financial support for the timely completion and the pre-sold housing, providing no cost of financing to local governments for them to purchase homes from developers and offer them as a public renter housing to the low-income people. Supporting reasonable financing needs of developers, encouraging financial institutions to support debt restructuring of developers, and to support the restructuring, mergers, and acquisitions in the real estate sector. As these measures gradually take effect, we have already seen some positive signs. In the first three quarters, floor space sold has increased by 6.8%, of which secondary housing market has increased a lot. The decline in the sales of the new houses has also narrowed significantly compared to the last year. It's uh, narrowed significantly. When we look at the spillover of real estate uh, as a financial, as a central bank, we are, we are concerned about the, we, are, we are pay attention to the, the spillover effects of real estate sector and the financial system. It is a quite limited. Uh, let me give the, some numbers. Of the standing real estate loans, uh, about 53 trillion RMB, accounting for 23 percent of the total bank loans. Around 8 percent of them are mortgage loans. China has long, has all long followed a highly potential mortgage lending policy, and now the MPAR ratio for the mortgage is 0.52 percent, that the MPAR for mortgage loans is 0 0.52 0.52%. Loans to developers account for about 20% of real estate lending. Their MPR now is at 2.7%. In general, China's real estate sector is searching for a new equilibrium. Yesterday, I read a report by Stand and Poor's. According to this report, market sentiment, contract volume, and the prices in China real estate sector have begun to show signs of normalization. It estimates that the property market, property market has nearly reached the bottom. That is the views of the standard polls. <laughs> Looking ahead, as the urbanization is the, still ongoing, uh, the group of the new urban residents is large and growing. The demand for basic and the improved housing is still large. We believe the foundation for the health and the stable development of the real estate sector remains solid. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Pan. Uh,
Noting you have almost 12.30, I think we still have time for one question from the floor. Tim Lewis, Chairman of the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission. Tim, go ahead. Thank you, Norman. Uh, Governor Pan, there have been concerns in the market uh, rela relating to the increase in local government debt in China in recent years. So my question is, what is your assessment of the overall situation and the potential risks associated with local government uh, debt? Mm. Uh, furthermore, what measures have been implemented by the uh, various authorities to mitigate such risks and how effective have such measures been so far? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. There is a lot of the discussions about the China's local government debt. Uh, uh, let me share with you my take on this issue. China total government debt. Let me speak first speak about the total, the China's total government debt level. It's uh, in the middle and the lower to lower range by international comparison. By official definition, as of the end of the last year, the government debt totaled 60 trillion RMB, accounting for about 50% of our GDP. In this total, central government debt accounting for 21% of GDP, it is uh, relatively low. Local government debt was around 35 trillion RMB. Using the BIS definition and the data, which include of, of the balance sheet debt, China's government debt is about 78% of GDP. It is still relatively low compared to the 109% for advanced economies and the 94% for the G20 economies. Through slightly through slightly higher than the 65% average for emerging market economies. Chinese local government debt has two features. The first, the debt was borrowed for infrastructure investment. It is backed by the tangible assets, has generated positive exter externalities and the, local and the local economy over the past three decades. Two, China is a large country with great regional disparity. Most of the local government debt is issued by the government in the eastern and the central provinces. With both the economic fundamentals for them, the debt is not a big problem. It is just a handful underdeveloped provinces in the West and the North East and the North East China that may face some difficulties in debt servicing. We have taken the following measures to address the debt problem. Placing more strict fiscal disciplines on local governments such as restrictions and new borrowings for investment in provinces with uh, debt problems. Tightening accountability to ensure local governments take their own responsibilities. They are encouraged to sell assets to pay debts. Encourage financial institutions to negotiate with the local governments in debt restructuring based on the market and the commercial principles. Encouraging local government financing vehicles to transform into market-based entities through MA, restructuring, or capital injection. I believe as the, this as the, this measures gradually take effect, hopefully the debt issue in some underdeveloped regions were mitigated, and this issue will gradually get resolved. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I must bring this session to an end so that you can have some lunch. A lot of hungry faces I can see. <laughs> now, may I invite you once again, give a round of applause to Governor Park. Thank you very much, Mr. Chan and Mr. Pan. And could you please stay on the stage for a second for a, a photo? Two rounds of photos, one for our official photographer and one for our friends in the media. Okay, and our media uh, photographers are at the back of the room. A big smile for them. Wonderful, thank you again, gentlemen.